Uh, I have the pleasure now of introducing uh, Dr. Chavin, who has come down to us from uh, Paris. He is one of my leading indicators. Uh, very often in the time that I've been in the Senate, I get a call from Eric saying, you know, you really ought to think about neonicotinoids. <laughs> and I say, oh yeah, sure. <laughs> and then I quickly turn to my staff and say, what the hell is a neonicotinoid? <laughs> and then I learn. And uh, over and over and over again, he has uh, been at the forefront of environmental issues. As I mentioned earlier, he has this wonderful John O'Pastore, Dr. John O'Pastore connection from his Nobel Prize winning work against nuclear war. Uh, but he's also one of the great uh, students and great experts on the uh, environmental perils that we are rushing headlong towards. So it gives me a great deal of pleasure to be able to uh, welcome Eric to Rhode Island and welcome him to the podium. Uh, thank you, Senator Whitehouse, for that wonderful introduction. I, I'm very sorry my parents uh, are not around, for my father would have been very proud to hear it, and my mother would have believed every word of it. <laughs> it's been a, a great pleasure and honor uh, to work with you these uh, past several years. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Rupert Friday for inviting me to give this keynote, and all of those uh, who have been in, involved in helping to put this important conference together. I'm delighted to be here this morning at this pivotal moment in human history when we must figure out how best to address the unparalleled global environmental dangers we face, the greatest threat ever to humanity. At a time when, as Senator Whitehouse said, the present administration and many, many Americans seem unable or unwilling to understand what lies ahead if we continue our present course. So this morning I'll try to shed some light on this dangerous disconnect and we'll speak about some medical models that may be useful in helping people better understand these dangers. But first a story. It seems that when Donald Trump and Steve Bannon were visiting Alaska to meet with Sarah Palin about a possible job for her, she invited them to go bear hunting. And so they drove to a nearby mountain and waited with their rifles loaded. And after a while, a large brown bear came into view. And Trump, Bannon, and Palin raised their guns, aimed, and fired. But all the triggers jammed. The bear heard the sound. And as it started charging towards them in a panic, in unison, Trump, Bannon, and Palin began to pray. They said, Dear Lord, we have always been your faithful servants. Dear Lord, please, please, please make that bear a Christian. <laughs> and just at that moment, the bear came to a sudden halt and it raised its huge paws to the sky and said, Dear Lord, I thank thee for the gift I am about to receive. <laughs> As you can probably tell, I'm rooting for the bears. <laughs> Even though two black bear completely destroyed my orchard's beehive some years ago, but I'm rooting for them because they are truly remarkable creatures, extremely valuable to human medicine, as you will soon hear. So since our Oxford University Press book, Sustaining Life, How Human Health Depends on Biodiversity, was published in 2008, I've spoken mainly about the book's subjects, providing examples of how our health and lives are affected <clears throat> when we damage the living world. And I'll do some of this today, but because I am increasing, increasingly alarmed about how rapidly we are altering planetary systems, and how relatively few people seem to recognize this, I've been spending a lot of time these days lecturing on what you will hear this morning. 
In 1980, with three other Harvard faculty members, I started an organization, as Senator Whitehouse said, called the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, which eventually included some 80 national organizations of physicians around the world. And in 1985, we won the Nobel Peace Prize. I'm that guy with the hair <laughs> holding the prize. We have Pastore. Uh, John, I'm sorry, John is right there. John O. Pastore. The most important contribution of the tens of thousands of physicians who were eventually part of this federation was to help people grasp what a nuclear war would really be like so that they knew that these weapons were so catastrophically destructive that they could not be used in wartime, and so that policymakers and the public would do everything in their power to prevent a nuclear war from occurring. Now, we did this by translating the abstract technical science of nuclear weapons explosions that world-class scientists had been talking about and warning about for decades into the concrete personal terms of human health, into everyday language that people could relate to and understand, namely what would really happen to people in such a war. We talked about skull fractures instead of the force of the explosion. We talked about third degree burns instead of the temperatures in the fireball, about radiation sickness instead of the amount of radiation in the fallout. And as a result of these concrete medical stories, I believed we helped make nuclear war more real for people. We made it harder for them to think about such wars in vague, abstract, technical terms. And in the process, I believe we helped change public opinion, and indeed, maybe even public policy about the use of these weapons. And that was why, in addition to our bringing physicians from the so former Soviet Union, and the United States and their allies together at the height of the Cold War, we won the Nobel Peace Prize. But in contrast to nuclear weapons explosions, changes to the global environment like climate change and the loss of biological diversity are much harder to grasp. We have no Hiroshima's or Nagasaki's to serve as models, as concrete examples of what will happen Global environmental changes, unlike explosions, can also be very hard to see. They often occur slowly or intermittently, sometimes almost imperceptibly, and on global scales. And they can be obscured by normal fluctuations in things like temperature or rainfall, which are changing naturally and often abruptly, and sometimes with large swings all the time. Our brains are wired to see what is happening right in front of us, right now. We don't do very well with seeing things that are not obvious, that happen incrementally, or that occur over large areas or in other parts of the world. It's very hard, for example, for us to grasp the meaning of concepts like average global temperatures. When we hear scientists say that the surface of the planet has warmed on average by about two degrees Fahrenheit since 1880 or so, around the time the Industrial Revolution began and humanity started burning fossil fuels on a large scale, and when we hear leading scientists say they're beside themselves with worry that the Earth may warm by an additional eight or more degrees Fahrenheit by the end of the century, or some 10 degrees warming in all, if we do not change our ways. It's hard for many of us to be terribly concerned about this. After all, it was minus 13 degrees Fahrenheit in Petersham, Massachusetts, where my heirloom fruit orchard is located, a year ago on February 15th. And two days later, it jumped to 55 degrees Fahrenheit an increase of 68 degrees in less than 48 hours. With such enormous temperature changes that we frequently experience, even over short periods, many may ask, what's a measly 10 degrees of warming by 2100? <coughs> but what we were t are talking about here is global averages, a concept that's very difficult to wrap one's mind around. 
Our experience with temperature is very much what's happening right here, right now. To help put in perspective what an average warming of the Earth's surface of 10 degrees Fahrenheit really means, let's go back in time to the end of the last ice age, some 18,000 years ago. At that time, when the average temperatures of the Earth's surface were only about 10 degrees Fahrenheit cooler than they are now, there was a layer of ice on top of where we are now sitting that was more than one mile thick. And the Atlantic Ocean was about 400 feet lower than it is now. That is the scale of what a change in average global temperatures of 10 degrees Fahrenheit is like. So all the changes we have already seen secondary to climate change, the dramatic increase in extreme weather events, the heat waves and droughts and fires, the enormous storms, the melting of ice all over the world, the dying of conifer forests in western states and Canada, the bleaching and loss of coral reefs, the coastal flooding, the change in the range of disease vectors, the extinction of countless species that could not adapt, all these changes have occurred with an average warming of only two degrees Fahrenheit. Not over thousands of years, but only since about 1880. So when we're talking about a warming of 10 degrees Fahrenheit, if we don't reverse the course we're on, we're talking about a world I believe we would have trouble recognizing. The task of grasping changes to the global environment is also made more difficult because there's such a fundamental misunderstanding that many, perhaps most people, have about the environment. Believing that we human beings are somehow separate from it, that it exists outside of us, and so as a result many people aren't terribly worried about degrading the atmosphere or the oceans or the soils as if these changes will have little to no effect on them whatsoever, almost as if they were happening someplace other than where we all live. Understanding what's happening to the environment is also hard for many people because scientists who describe this often speak in technical, jargon-filled language that most people cannot follow, including policymakers. I'm sorry to say that scientists are mostly trained to talk to one another, a problem which is becoming more and more pronounced as science becomes more and more specialized. Moreover, scientists are always talking about probability and will never say with certainty, good scientists, that, for example, that we're causing North Atlantic hurricanes to become larger and more powerful with our ever-increasing use of fossil fuels or Arctic ice in Greenland to melt. Scientists are always hedging their bets, for that's the way of science to provide the best and most probable explanation for a series of observations until a better one comes along. The deniers, on the other hand, are often more convincing as they're always 100% certain. <laughs> there are other reasons that we human beings have such a hard time grasping what we're doing to the global environment. For one, the storms and floods and droughts and fires, famine, extinctions, epidemics associated with climate change are too frightening and overwhelming to most people for them to want to think about and seem too large and difficult to solve, making them feel helpless and hopeless. Feelings will all do anything possible to avoid experiencing. Frankly, I too would rather have a glass of wine and watch Antiques Roadshow and think about Greenland melting for the Celtics. <laughs> Not the Patriots, but that's another story. <laughs> Many people also feel that changes to the environment are not worth worrying about, believing that if science got us into this mess, it surely will get us out, that we'll invent or synthesize or engineer our way out of all of our difficulties. And while science has much to offer, we must be humble and fully aware of its limitations, especially in the face of understanding and in finding ways to alter such highly complex systems. And finally, 
there has been a widespread, sophisticated, and highly effective campaign, much as there was by the tobacco industry, to cast doubt on the science of global environmental change and to discredit the scientists. And here, I'm speaking for myself and myself alone, not for the organizers of this conference or anyone or any group connected to it in any way. You need to know that as I get older, I'm increasingly outspoken, as I try to follow the advice of Gandhi as much as I can, who said that in life, quote, one must be truthful, peaceful, and fearless, end of quote. And this profoundly and dangerously ignorant campaign of disinformation has been funded by some corporations and individuals and has been disseminated by many politicians, including our president and the chairs of the House Science Committee and the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee and the head of the EPA, Scott Pruitt, who two days ago said CO2 is not a main contributor to climate change and by right-wing think tanks like the, like the competitive, competitive Enterprise Institute, and by some media outlets like Fox News and the editorial pages of the Wall Street Journal, and talk show hosts like Rush Limbaugh, which tens of millions of people watch, read, and listen to. So it is not at all surprising that many people believe there is a significant debate going on in the scientific community, which there is not about whether human activity is harming the global environment and that many people don't know what or whom to believe. I'm afraid there is really no other way to say this, but in my view, those who support this campaign, while knowing full well the dangers involved, are guilty of crimes against humanity. So that is my first point. So that is my first point, that man-made changes to the global environment are too technical and complicated and abstract for most people to grasp, too frightening and unpleasant for them to want to think about, and people are therefore highly vulnerable to being lulled into believing that the changes we are experiencing are the result of natural cycles and are not worth worrying about. And so, as was true with the issue of nuclear war, we must help educate people about what is really happening to the environment in language they can relate to and understand. And there's no more compelling way to do this, in my view, than by talking about health. And that's why I'm here today. Now my second point. Let me give you a few examples of the value of using a medical model to help people understand the human consequences of altering the global environment. Polar bears, these magnificent creatures, the Earth's largest land carnivores, evolved from brown bears around the same time as did our species. As Senator White has said, some 195,000 to 200,000 years ago. It's predicted they will be extinct in the wild by the end of this century, if not before. Largely because of global warming and the melting of the Arctic ice sheet, as this leads to their inability to capture seals, their main food. Polar bears wait at thin areas of ice for seals. They have ex exquisite hearing. Marine mammals like themselves to come up for air. But if there are large areas of open water, which is increasingly becoming the case. The Arctic ice sheet is now at its lowest level since our species first walked on Earth. And there are estimates that it will be gone completely, even if the Paris summit's uh, temperature uh, uh, levels are uh, kept, kept below 2 degrees centigrade. And if there's open, uh, open areas of water, <clears throat> then seals can elude capture. They can come up here, and the polar bears are waiting on this ice sheet. And that's why polar bears are starving, having fewer cubs, and are threatened. Now, polar bears have become iconic figures in discussions about what we will lose if we don't reduce our reliance on fossil fuels. Adorable polar bear cubs, as you know, are almost on every environmental poster, and people are heartbroken by their expected loss. But polar bears' medical value 
is almost never mentioned. Let me tell you about this. This shows a mother black bear and her cubs hibernating. Her glazed expression is the result of her having been put to sleep by an anesthetic dart. Like all bears that hibernate, polar bears are essentially immobile for five to seven months or more, and yet they don't get osteoporosis, the loss of bone mass. In each of us, there is a dynamic process going on where cells called osteoblasts are making new bone, and other cells called osteoclasts are resorbing bone. Our bone architecture is constantly being remodeled. Under conditions where there is no weight bearing, no muscles pulling on bone, the equilibrium shifts to one's bones becoming thinner and weaker. Every other mammal, including human beings, even other true hibernators like woodchucks and bats, lose bone mass during periods of immobility. We would lose a third of our bone, for example, after five months of being bedridden. But hibernating bears do not. Osteoporosis is a huge public health problem, particularly for the elderly, particularly for postmenopausal women because of the role of estrogen. Now, we can do many things to reduce our risk, like get enough calcium and vitamin D in our food and in supplements. We can stay active and exercise regularly, the most important thing we can do. We can also take medicines called bisphosphonates to reduce the amount of bone loss or to halt it. But we cannot put back new bone once we lose it. Osteoporosis causes 70,000 deaths in the United States each year. We have the highest osteoporosis rates in the world. Hibernating bears have compounds in their bloodstreams that prevent osteoporosis, compounds that may someday allow us to effectively treat and possibly even prevent this largely untreatable disease. Now, bears also don't eat, drink, urinate, or defecate for the months they're hibernating. And yet they don't become dehydrated, they don't starve, and they don't get sick from not urinating. If we don't urinate for a few days, we die. No one fully understands how bears do this, but somehow they're able to recycle their urinary wastes, break them down, and turn them into proteins. More than 26 million Americans have chronic kidney disease, many of whom go on to kidney failure and die. There is no treatment other than dialysis or kidney transplantation for kidney failure, which kills more than 87,000 people each year in the United States alone. By studying hibernating bears, we may find ways of treating this dreaded condition of coral reefs. They defend themselves and paralyze their prey for food, worms, small fish, and other mollusks by firing poison-coated harpoon at them. Now, there's 700 known species, and each species makes some 200 distinct toxins. This is an explosion in evolution, not only in terms of the number of species in one genus, uh, marine genus, but in the number of chemicals that are made. So cone snails are thought to make as many as 140,000 distinct Pep, what they're called peptides, small protein toxins. Only a hundred or so have been studied in any detail. But even among this extremely small percentage of the total, they have been shown to target almost every known molecular receptor on our cells, from nerve cells to heart cells to those in other organ systems. These receptors regulating the function of these cells. One of these toxins has been discovered to be a painkiller that is not only a thousand times more potent than morphine, but which does not cause addiction or tolerance. The condition where one has to keep giving larger and larger doses with continued use as the effectiveness lessens over time. Opiates, as many of us know, have had surgery or broken a bone, like morphine, are extremely effective painkillers for acute pain. But because of tolerance, 
They are not for severe chronic pain. They stop working or diminish in, in their potency over time. The finding of a potent painkiller from cone snails that does not cause tolerance is a watershed event in medicine. Some believe that cone snails may provide more leads with these 140,000 different toxins to important medications for people than any other group of organisms in nature. And yet, as I said, they live in coral reefs, which are threatened the world over. So that is what ocean warming and acidification and losing coral reefs really means for us. Finally, let me switch gears a bit and talk about another area of environmental change, deforestation. In this case, complicated by climate change. This is a map of Lyme disease cases in the United States a few years ago, showing uh, individual cases. Each dot is a case. Note the concentration as not a surprise. In the middle Atlantic states and in southern New England, you can see the Cape and Martha's Vineyard in Nantucket, and all of Rhode Island and Connecticut and Massachusetts in black. There's also a smattering of cases in the uh, upper mid, uh, there's a lot of cases in the upper Midwest and in the uh, Pacific Coast, Pacific Northwest, and a smattering in southern, southeastern United States. Now, if you look at this concentration carefully, you can see that it is almost identical with the blue states during the 2004 <laughs> presidential election. And this fact has caused some to conclude that Lyme disease may have a positive effect on portions of one's brain that are the seats of intelligence and judgment. So in 2008, Obama and Biden captured former red states like Iowa and o Ohio and Virginia and others, leading some to suggest that we should be looking for cases of Lyme disease in these states as well. Of course, this is totally bogus, but I just wanted to make sure you were all paying attention, and yes, you are. So Lyme disease is the most common vector-borne disease in the United States today. Until just two years ago, the CDC estimated there were about 30,000 cases a year. But that recent estimate is 10 times that. Now they're saying there are at least 300,000 cases in the United States every year. The reason these numbers are difficult to estimate is that a very large number of cases are missed, as many of you may know. Lyme disease is often very hard to detect. The early symptoms resemble a bad flu. The ticks are very, very small and hard to see. They may not cause a local skin reaction. The classic bullseye rash of Lyme appears in only 75 to 80 percent of people. The blood tests are often negative early on. If left untreated, Lyme can result in serious chronic health problems with effects on joints, the nervous system, and the cardiovascular system. I suspect many people in this room have had Lyme or know someone who has. Now, it was noticed that in some parts of the country where there was little vertebrate diversity, there was more Lyme disease. And some elegant research demonstrated why this may be so. Lyme is a complex disease involving an infectious agent, a bacterium, it's a spirochete with the name of Borrelia burgdorferi, the transmitter or vector of the bacterium, where we are, it's the eastern black-legged tick, shown here, also called the deer tick. And hosts that support the proliferation of the pathogen and its passage to another host. In the east, the most important host is the white-footed mouse. Now, we're also a host, but we're an incompetent host. In fact, we are a dead-end host. That is, we get Lyme disease, but we don't pass it on to other organisms when ticks bite us and then bite other animals. It turns out that ticks are, are omnivorous feeders and that they bite almost any vertebrate that crosses their path in search of a blood meal. 
They will bite us, our dogs and cats, other rodents like chipmunks or squirrels, birds, even reptiles. Now many of the animals ticks bite, like us, are incompetent, and some are dead-end hosts. So if there is a lot of vertebrate diversity around, there are a lot of animals around for ticks to bite that do not pass on the Lyme infection. The result is the pathogen, the Lyme bacteria, becomes diluted in hosts that do not pass it on. And therefore, it's less likely for ticks to become infected in these areas where there's a lot of vertebrate diversity and less likely for us to get the disease. There's another mechanism that keeps infection rates low for us when there's a lot of vertebrate diversity, and that is there are more animals competing with the best host, white-footed mice, which easily pass on the disease, uh, competing with them for food. And there are also many other animals like foxes and hawks and weasels and bobcats, which eat white-footed mice like Godiva chocolates, all of which results in reduced white-footed mouse populations and a lower chance of people who in these, in, for people who live in these forests or at the edge of them to become infected with Lyme. So the diversity of vertebrates serves as a protector for our getting a serious infectious disease. The fragmentation of forests in the United States is one of the main reasons for losing vertebrate diversity, which then increases, as I said, our, list, our risk for getting Lyme. This is a photo of forest fragmentation around Bear Lake in Maine, and the clear-cut patches are several acres to tens of acres. So such deforestation now happening all over the country and New England as well, not only threatens countless species like woodpeckers and owls and forest floor organisms like salamanders, it also leads to an increased risk of getting Lyme by fragmenting the forest and resulting in reduced vertebrate diversity. This issue is becoming much more of greater concern because wood pellets uh, production is proliferating and much uh, 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 sending uh, huge amounts of such pellets to Europe for uh, creating electricity, founded on the notion that burning wood biomass is carbon neutral. And this is a totally renewable resource. Yes, it is, but sometimes it takes decades, even a hundred years, for forests to start acting as the same carbon sink that they were before they were cut down. So one last slide on this. This is, uh, shows a tenfold increase of Lyme in Maine from the year 2004 to 2009, a result of both increasing forest fragmentation and warmer winters. You can see the Lyme cases spreading from the coast uh, up the coast and then inland. Uh, during this time, tenfold increase in cases. Some of this is from better detection, uh, clearly. So, um, one one other quick point. I know um, I'm running out of time here, but um, to illustrate a, a, a really tragic story that some of you may have heard, it illustrates the complexity of uh, biological systems. So it's been very, very warm in northern New England, including in Maine. And this is, has, uh, not today, but, but uh, uh, throughout this winter, it's been one of the warmest, as you know, uh, we have had. It's perhaps been the warmest. And the tick population, which normally is held in check by very cold winter temperatures, has skyrocketed in places like Maine. No one would have predicted uh, that this has anything to do with the moose population. Uh, but what's happened is that moose, adult moose, and in particular moose calves, are infested with the ticks that survived the winter, which are uh, sucking their blood, weakening them severely, and the, t and the uh, mortality for moose calves has increased uh, markedly during this past year. I, I mention this 
uh, because it illustrates the complexity of biological systems and the different parts of it that are very, sometimes very hard to predict, but this is an effect of climate change. So I want to start winding down my talk by looking at the role of evidence and proof in medicine and how important they are as models for helping people understand the need for action when the risks are great. This is my third medical point. In making a medical diagnosis, a physician relies on genetics, the present and past history, a physical exam, lab tests, imaging studies like x-rays or CAT scans or MRIs. But unlike in science, where one tries to prove a hypothesis, in medicine, it is rarely possible to have enough evidence to establish a proof before one has to act. Decisions are made based on an accumulated body of evidence, and the urgency of making them is based on the degree of risk involved. The greater the risk, the less evidence one relies on before making a decision. One doesn't have time to wait to make a decision. This is what's called the precautionary principle. But in medicine, it's not an abstract scientific idea. It's something medical professionals must deal with every day. Let me give you an example. If a child less than one month old shows up at the hospital with a fever of more than 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit, 38 degrees centigrade, that child is immediately put on two broad spectrum antibiotics after blood, urine, and cerebral spinal fluid that aids the brain and spinal cord are drawn for bacterial cultures. One doesn't wait until the cultures come back two days later before starting treatment. One can't afford to wait, for in that time, a bacterial infection could spread rapidly through the infant's body and kill it. More than 90% of fevers in infants are, in fact, caused by viruses, not bacteria, and are not treatable by antibiotics. And only a small fraction of those that are, are caused by bacteria. I'm sorry, so only a small fraction of those, bye-bye, Senator. <laughs> really wanted him to hear the end of my talk. <laughs> Senator Whitehouse. Oh, he's gone. I'm going to come to your office and give you the end of my talk. I promise. Let me go back. Forgive me. Um, so, as I said, if a child shows up with this degree of fever, they immediately draw uh, cultures, but they immediately start them on antibiotics. But almost all of those infections are caused by viruses, not by bacteria, which the antibiotics would be treating. And only a small fraction that are caused by bacteria go on to cause serious problems or death. But the risk of not starting antibiotics immediately on all the infants with high fever is much too great. For by not doing so, one takes the risk that one or more of them, perhaps one out of a hundred, perhaps even one out of a thousand, will become dangerously ill and may die. And that is a risk no pediatrician is willing to make. So that is the model we need for making decisions about reducing greenhouse gas emissions and for addressing other assaults to the global environment. The risks of inaction and delay are so enormous, so potentially catastrophic for the planet, not just for now, but for hundreds and even thousands of years. In the case of the melting of Greenland and the Antarctic and acidification of the oceans, perhaps for tens of thousands of years to come, that to wait until we have absolute proof, absolute certainty of what will happen, is to take a risk with the physical, chemical, and biological systems of the planet to do, in essence, a global experiment with our own health and lives, 
to take a risk that no member of Congress, no president, that no one should ever be willing to take. That's the lesson of Madison. So I want to end my talk with this next image that was taken by the Voyager 1 spacecraft. Voyager 1 was launched in 1977 with computers, hard to believe this, that had one 240,000th the memory of a low-end iPhone today. <laughs> Voyager 1 left our solar system in 2014 after 37 years in space. It had traveled 11.7 billion miles, equivalent to 125 trips between the Earth and the Sun. At the suggestion of Carl Sagan on February 14, 1990, when the spacecraft was over four billion miles away from Earth, NASA directed Voyager to turn around and photograph the planets of the solar system. One image showed the Earth, what Sagan called the pale blue dot. Hard to see here, there it is, um, here enlarged. I want to read what Carl Sagan, whom I was lucky enough to know and to have considered a friend, what Carl, who died tragically at a very young age, said about that pale blue dot. Quote, look at that dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was, lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, young couple in love, mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, corrupt politician and superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on a moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam. The earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. Think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors so that in glory and triumph they could become the momentary masters of a fraction of a dot. Think of the endless cruelties visited by the inhabitants of one corner of this pixel on the scarcely distinguishable inhabitants of some other corner. How frequent their misunderstandings, how eager they are to kill one another, how fervent their hatreds. Our posturings, our imagined self-importance, the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe are challenged by this point of pale light. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In our obscurity, in all this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. The Earth is the only world known so far to harbor life. There is nowhere else, at least in the near future, to which our species could migrate. Visit, yes. Settle, not yet. Like it or not, for the moment, the Earth is where we make our stand. It has been said that astronomy is a humbling and character-building experience. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image of our tiny world. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and perish and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known." End of quote. Now, my wife and I live in, in Boston's Fenway Studios, a National Historic Landmark that's two blocks from Boston Red Sox Fenway Park. 
It was built for artists as live workspace. She is a printmaker and a painter and art professor. We live in the studio that was first occupied in 1905 by painter and teacher Philip Leslie Hale, grandnephew of Edward Everett, the governor of Massachusetts, U.S. Senator, Secretary of State, and a great orator who had the highly unfortunate role of being the warm-up act for Abraham Lincoln at the dedication of the Gettysburg National <coughs> Cemetery in 1863. <clears throat> Everett spoke for a full two hours, followed by Lincoln's two-minute Gettysburg Address. <clears throat> One of the great talks of all time. Philip Hale, person who lived in our studio, his father, Edward Everett Hale, was a polymath author, editor, historian, abolitionist, chaplain of the U.S. Senate. He is known for a quote that I believe summarizes what each of us goes through in our work to protect the environment, what each of us feels on some level whenever we try to do anything that is larger than ourselves. So I want to honor Edward Everett Hale's memory by repeating what he said, quote, I am only one, but I am one. I cannot do everything, but I can do something. And because I cannot do everything, I will not refuse to do the something that I can do. What I can do, I should do. And live at this moment in history. For the changes to the environment I've spoken about are caused by our own behavior. And we have the ability, our generation, especially those of us in the richest, most powerful nation on the planet, especially those of us in this room who are among the most privileged and influential members of our society. We have the ability and the responsibility to help turn them around. It's up to us. Who will do it if we do not? And so I urge all of you to learn as much as you can about what human beings are doing to the global environment, to use all of your enormous creativity and intelligence and energy and resources to join us at Harvard and in other academic institutions and in environmental and land and water conservation groups in the US and around the world, to speak out, to become even more involved, to be fearless in combating the appalling ignorance and greed and corruption that underlie the destruction of our common home, to do everything in your power to preserve our wondrous living world, our pale blue dot, this indescribably beautiful and precious gift we have all been given. Thank you.